This podcast is made possible by you, the supporters of WPLN and WNXP, Nashville Public Radio. This is the Nash Villager Podcast. It's September 26, 2024. The original Parthenon, you know, the one on the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, was blown to pieces on this day in 1687. It was being used as a gunpowder depot by the Ottoman leaders in charge of the city at that time. So when forces from Venice laid siege to the Acropolis, the ancient temple was a huge target. It essentially was a bomb in need of a fuse. And the Venetian captain general was willing and able to set it off. It just took one round of fire from his artillery to set off the explosion. But in the end, it was destroyed for relatively little gain. Venice won that battle. They gained control of Athens. But a year or so later, the Ottomans won it back. I'm Nina Cardona, and this is your Daily Digest of what's happening around Middle Tennessee from Nashville Public Radio, WPLN News. A quick word on the news of the day. Yesterday, the state released a pretty scathing investigative report about Nashville's district attorney. You're going to hear our initial coverage in the newscast portion of today's episode. I feel confident that at some point, I'll open the podcast with more of a deep dive into what's going on, but it's still early days for that developing story. There's a lot to figure out and process. WPLN News is on the case, and as I said, you're about to get a nice big chunk of information in the newscast. As someone who grew up in Middle Tennessee, it took me a long time to understand just how weird it is that we have a Parthenon of our own. I mean, it still feels like a very natural thing to me, but at this point, I've seen the looks on visitors' faces. I've heard the tone in transplants' voices when they ask, But um, why? So intellectually, yes, I can admit that it's odd. But as I assume everyone who has asked that question has been told, it's the whole thing that before we were Music City, Nashville was called the Athens of the South because the city was a center for learning. Or at least it wanted to be seen that way. An early leader at the University of Nashville came up with the slogan in the 1820s and used it in recruiting high-caliber professors to come work for him. The slogan was well-established and beloved by the time of the Tennessee Centennial Exposition of 1897, and so it seemed like a no-brainer to have one of the buildings celebrate Nashville in the shape of an icon of old Athens, just as another of the exposition's buildings was a pyramid as a nod to Memphis being named for a city in Egypt. Nashville's first Parthenon wasn't supposed to be permanent. It was just made of plaster. But locals fell in love with the thing. When the rest of the exposition, like the pyramid, was demolished and carted away, people insisted that the Parthenon stay in place. They tried to keep it standing by patching the plaster up from time to time. But after about 20 years, it was clear it had to come down. The present permanent structure was built in its place. I'm not sure what motivated the Nashvilleians of the 1920s to fully commit to making it an exact replica of the original. It could have had a tone more like the odd, scaled-down recreations of the old world that have been built at Las Vegas casinos. Instead, it really is as faithful as it could be, given that the one in Athens is half a world away and had been boned pieces for centuries by the time this project began. It's not like they could send someone to measure the particulars of the original roof or whatever. But the columns taper and angle slightly, just like the columns of the ancient Parthenon. There are slight variations in their diameter and spacing because that's how the ancient builders made theirs. The horizontal elements all include a slight arch. These tiny variations aren't really perceptible to the naked eye, but they all add up to a certain warmth and refinement. Through the years, the city has committed to making the Parthenon more and more accurate. In 1990, the massive statue of Athena was added to the interior. The original was built to be a temple to that goddess. And as research came to show that the ancient Greeks actually added color to their ancient stone buildings and sculptures, historically faithful touches of color were added to Nashville's replica. In a way, what started as just a symbol of civic pride has become a living laboratory, a place to imagine and understand the original function and appearance of the long-destroyed temple in Athens, 
in a different way from what's possible on the original site. But if you ever wonder why Nashville's Parthenon also includes a basement level art gallery or why it hosts concerts, well, that goes back to the original function of the temporary building. During the Centennial Exposition, the smaller plaster Parthenon was the fair's fine arts building. And one lasting legacy of that event is that the fine art programming has never stopped. In just a few minutes, we'll hear how far rural Tennesseans have to go for chemotherapy. That's coming up after the newscast. Nashville Public Radio is always here to keep you informed, whether it's the latest news or music you should check out. Every week, What Wear Wednesday shares the latest happenings taking place right here in Nashville by talking to members of our community, putting on events in your neighborhood and beyond. So tune in to What Wear Wednesdays every Wednesday, and you can always find events at WNXP.org slash events. Here's the latest from WPLN News. A scathing investigation of Nashville's district attorney finds that he has been recording defense attorneys and his own staff using a surveillance system. Criminal defense attorneys often discuss confidential information within the DA's evidence viewing room. The report finds that since 2020, those rooms have been under surveillance, and prosecutors handling those criminal cases have been able to request recordings of what defense attorneys said behind closed doors. Those practices inside the office of Nashville's district attorney may have violated state law, the U.S. Constitution, and ethical rules set for attorneys. Tennessee's attorney general says the case is not enough to bring charges. WPLN's criminal justice reporter Paige Flager says the findings have also been handed over to the Board of Professional Responsibility. After considering the comptroller's investigation, or even conducting their own, that board could recommend that formal disciplinary charges be filed against Funk. There would be a hearing, which would likely be open to the public. If the board shows Funk acted unethically, then a panel could recommend his dismissal, public censure, suspension, or disbarment. WPLN reached out to the board for comment or next steps, but has not yet received a response. The report also found that employees helped Funk's re-election campaign using government resources and that one employee had been reassigned and surveilled after one of her family members supported another candidate for the position in 2022. WPLN's Catherine Sweeney explains why that matters. The problem wouldn't be that office workers helped out with the campaign. They're allowed to do things like set up for events or write speeches and tweets. The thing is, they have to do it on their own time. Since they're government employees, taxpayers fund their salaries. They're supposed to be working for everyone in the county, even people who wouldn't vote for their boss. They're also not supposed to use government-owned equipment, like computers, to help the campaign. The comptroller alleges Funk's employees used government email services to send out campaign materials and solicit donations. It has evidence that employees then backdated paid time off requests to make it look like they weren't on the clock during those activities. Administrators at Tennessee State University say the school is in a financial crisis caused by lower student enrollment and less revenue from tuition. At a question and answer session for faculty and staff, Executive Vice President Daryl Burnett said the school would implement a hiring freeze and not replace vacant roles unless they were, quote, mission critical. Administrators also announced cuts to travel expenses and closing underutilized buildings. They did not say if there would be layoffs. However, Burnett cited a 2019 study showing that TSU has a lower student to staff ratio than other peer institutions in Tennessee. The Tennessee State University ratio at that time, 2019, was 7 to 1 in comparison to one of our state institutions, Middle Tennessee State, its staffing ratio to student was 14 to 1. This fiscal austerity comes one year after the U.S. Department of Education found that the Tennessee government owed TSU more than $2 billion in legally required payments. Wilson County schools are cutting back on the number of cafeteria meals students can charge without paying. In the first month of classes, the district school lunch debt totaled $1,000. At that rate, officials say students could end up owing as much as $100,000 altogether by the end of the school year. 
Administrators say the problem is not families who can't afford to pay. There are programs to offer free and reduced lunch, and they say no child will go hungry due to a true lack of funds. Instead, officials believe many students are charging their meals simply because they can. The option is available to offer some leeway to kids who forgot or misplaced their lunch money. WSMV reports the school board voted this week to set a $30 cap on an individual student's credit balance. The University of Tennessee football team is ranked among the best in the nation, and now the program is leading its peers in a new ticket pricing idea. UT recently announced a 10% talent fee on season ticket packages. It's designed to help pay athletes and attract talent as college athletics undergoes a revolution in compensating players. Under the new name, image, and likeness compensation rules, schools have agreed to pay hundreds of thousands of athletes dating back to 2016. The Associated Press reports several programs are increasing ticket prices to help handle that expense, with UT the first to use the talent fee term. You'll find more news anytime at WPLN.org. More rural hospitals have cut chemotherapy services in Tennessee than almost every other state. That's happening as an estimated 43,000 Tennesseans get a cancer diagnosis annually. For those in rural areas where treatment options are becoming more scarce, it means long drives and lots of planning. WPLN's Katherine Sweeney tells us what pressures are causing these cuts and how they're affecting patients. Carla Ryder is sitting with her mother-in-law at a table in the common area. It has a kitchen with several stoves, stainless steel refrigerators and sinks. A few travel-sized cereal boxes lie around for the taking. We're at the Hope Lodge, a tall building in that part of midtown Nashville where all the hospitals and medical offices are. It offers housing to cancer patients traveling here from rural areas. On this hot afternoon, the riders are one of a few families putting snacks together and chatting, and Carla looks tired. The night before, the pair made the three-hour trip to Nashville from Crossville, and today she had a chemo treatment. She says getting to stay at the lodge has been a lifesaver, but that doesn't mean it's been easy. It involves, you know, someone to stay with you, Someone to take care of your house while you're gone. Someone to take care of your kids, your animals, whatever. Do you have kids or pets? I do. We have two small children, and we have all kinds of animals. We have goats, chickens, dogs, a few birds. That being said, it's better than the alternative, which is three hours in each direction for a long, hard day. I mean, you, you get up, you know, Get ready, 6 o'clock. My appointment, you know, is at 8 o'clock, and you you might get home by 2 o'clock. That's an all-day appointment, three days a week. That's like a job. I mean, really. Situations like writers have become more common in Tennessee as rural hospitals drop chemotherapy services. From 2014 to 2022, about half of the rural hospitals that once offered chemotherapy cut the program. That's according to a report from healthcare consulting firm Chartis that looks into financial pressures on rural safety net hospitals. The report ranks Tennessee fourth in the nation for these losses. There are a lot of factors playing into that, says Dr. Neil Hayes, the director of the Cancer Center at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. For one, chemotherapy drugs used to be pretty affordable. New, pricier drugs started coming out in the early 2000s when Hayes was getting his start as a cancer doctor. Patients would have to come up with several hundred dollars for drugs that were coming out you know, at that time, whereas previously, chemotherapy drugs and, say, antibiotics might have been kind of in a similar scale for cost. And now... It's not uncommon for us to administer drugs that might have retail cost of you know nine or $10,000 per IV dose, for a single dose. Nurses, doctors, and pharmacists who specialize in oncology services are rare compared to a lot of other specialties, which means they're more expensive. And oncology departments often have to use a special computer program for health records that other departments aren't using. Another expense. Hayes says health systems with multiple hospitals will often consolidate their cancer services to one site to save money on costs like these. There are some struggles on the pay side, too. One example, 
Back in the day, Hay says, doctors would have patients stay at the hospital for a few days if they were frail and having an especially hard time with their treatment, just to keep an eye on them. That rarely happens anymore. I mean, almost never happens anymore. And it's not that we wouldn't want to do it on occasion, but the insurance company might deny the admission and, you know, send the bill to the patient instead of paying for it. That's why options like the Hope Lodge are becoming even more necessary. It's run by the American Cancer Society and offers no-cost accommodations to patients that live at least 40 miles from their treatment center. Derek Calderara is the lodge's senior manager. He says one of the most surprising things he learned was how quickly this disruption hits patients. Within a matter of days, certain things happen, and next thing you know, they're out the door, they're here, they're starting treatments, which is incredible for the medical side of it. But from just being a human being, I can't even begin to comprehend what that feels like, being yanked out of your home, being in this new environment in a city where if you're not used to a city like Nashville is its own beast. Ryder is down to one day a week of treatment, which means fewer hours long treks down Interstate 40. But that took a while. I started in September of last year. So it's almost a year, a whole full year. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. People don't realize how in depth it is, how long it takes. Catherine Sweeney, WPLN News. We do this roundup of Nashville news every weekday. Please consider subscribing on your favorite podcasting app. If that app has a thumbs up or review option, give us a little love. It really helps more people hear about us. And of course, everything at WPLN News is listener supported. You can make a donation at WPLN.org. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. Let's make this day a good one. And we'll catch back up tomorrow.